Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. In today's episode, we are honored to be sitting down with East Willenberry Councillor Susan Leahy. But before we dive into today's interview, a brief moment to remind everyone of our newest show, Municipal Affairs, where we dive into the biggest news stories municipally from across Canada with interviews with local elected leaders and discussions on everyone's mind. Search Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown on Spotify or visit the Cross Border Interviews YouTube channel to watch the latest show now. Now, on to the interview. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and taking time out of your busy schedule to talk about yourself and talking about your community. But I want to start with who Susan is, and I want to get to the crux of the entire interview with one question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Susan? I'm passionate about democracy. I really am. I'm passionate about democracy, about community, and I believe it stems from becoming a parent. When I became a parent, everything in my world shifted. So I began to look at the world in a different way, not just my local community, but everything about around me because I had a different interaction with the, with the community. And so I was looking around and I was thinking to myself, I'm not exactly comfortable with everything that I'm seeing. I see areas where there, there could be improvements. I think I should be involved in making some improvements so that the community that my children are in and that the world that we are in um, is a better place. Ultimately, I think that that's what everyone's purpose is, is to make the world a better place in whatever way we can uh, in terms of, uh, of making a difference. So it came from a sense of wanting to make a difference. And then it became uh, getting involved with as a volunteer uh, um, in different uh, aspects of the community. And then that ultimately led to running for town council. So there's a lot to unpack there. And I kind of want to start at the beginning, if you don't mind. Um, you were, you seem you say you're self-described uh you you enjoy democracy and you're passionate about democracy um was was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up was it something that was discussed <laughs> around the table and to caveat that was municipal politics discussed at the dinner table no no politics at <laughs> all i grew up in a household where you did not talk about politics religion sex money, none of those topics that turn out to be the most important topics in life when you grow up, right? So um, I, I guess I kind of, because there was, was no conversations about those, uh, those topics, um, now as an adult, I am devoted to, um, uh, especially politics, uh, talking about that, having conversations about that. I became, as I said, as a parent, I, that's when I started to become involved. I, I had my own opinions, but because I was raised that way, I didn't share my political opinions. So what I started to do was um, at the federal level, at the provincial level, I started um, helping out. I started volunteering and I started paying more attention uh, but I, to what was going on in terms of uh, current affairs. But um, as I was growing up and in, even in my 20s, I didn't feel comfortable sharing my opinions. But something happens to a woman, I think in particular, after the age of 50, uh, now I'm very comfortable sharing my opinions on all different topics, including and especially politics. Well, we're going to be talking about some of those issues and topics in a few minutes here, but I want to continue on you for a little bit here because... I, I try to do as little bit of research as possible when I'm talking to my guests because I like to learn from them, right? Because I don't want to go in with a set agenda and say, I know about you and my listeners are not going to learn the same way that I did because I took time out of my day to learn. So I'm learning from you. But there is one thing I do find. I find out when the first time you ran. And from what I can figure out, it was 2018 that you were first putting your name on the ballot. Now, mm -hmm. you were unsuccessful in that campaign, but you decided four years later to come back in 2022, one year ago, literally last month, to put your name for it again. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about that 2018 campaign for a little bit, if you don't mind. And I want to mm -hmm. ask this. You say your your focus changed when you became a mother and it sort of re-energized of what you, your priorities were. 
Was that all that was the factor of making your decision to get into politics? Or was there something going on in the community that you said, Susan's voice needs to be around the table to help address this? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I saw areas where we needed change. And uh, in 2018, uh, I really, it was my first time ever uh, running for any political office, uh, a lot to learn, right? I put my heart and soul into it, 150%. I didn't really have an understanding of all the strategies that were required to uh, to get those votes and to get them out at the polls. But I learned from that experience. It was, you know, when when that when that election happened, I literally it was so physically and mentally exhausting. I think I, I think it was about three days I was in bed, you know, and I had cried and I, you know, felt sorry for myself. But someone at that time, a good friend, gave me the best advice that I have ever received. And she said to me, Susan, she said, "Keep being who you are and doing what you do, and it will all work out in the end." And so then fast forward four years and post pandemic and uh, and I decided, yes, I would throw my hat into the ring again. And the second time around, I'd learned from all of those experiences the first time. My name in the community had, uh, I spent those, those following four years, even though I lost, I continued my volunteer work. I continued working on, on boards in the community. I've served on, on multiple different volunteer boards that, including at the provincial level on the Ontario Arts Council, all areas to do with my uh, career, my profession, which is a professional art appraiser. The, I saw a need, a general need in my community for change. Uh, we're our, we are the fastest growing municipality in all of Canada, East Gwillimbury. And uh, we had some a leadership uh, that had been there a long time. And it, we live in an interesting community because we're trying to find a balance between two different camps. The camp of everyone has always, was born here, raised here, spent their entire lives here. And then people who are referred to as newcomers, who maybe even if they've lived here for 20 years, they're, they're considered newer um, residents in the community. And so I actually unseated an incumbent when I won last year. And I believe that that is because the voters also saw what I was seeing was that we needed um, an injection of some fresh energy and and possibly a new and different perspective. So I grew up in a neighboring uh, community of Newmarket, uh, which is a 15 minute drive from East Gwillimbury in Mount Albert specifically. And uh, you know, I remember the days when Young Street was, wasn't even developed with stores, when it was still fields and farms and barns and horses. Uh, it's very different today. We are uh, growing quickly. And so I saw the need for uh, someone in, in terms of leadership who could do their very best to ensure the quality of life that we enjoy here, because we are unique in terms of our geography. We live, my ward in particular is a large geographical area. And, uh, but then we have our little downtown core and Mount Albert is kind of like the Alaska of the United States. So we're part of East Willenberry, but we're, we're kind of off to the side a little bit. And so it was about, um, it was about a different perspective and my experiences in life and living in different countries, and we can we can talk about my career and where it's led me uh, in terms of my of being a professional art appraiser. But I believe that the skill set that I had and the different perspective that I had uh, would bring benefits to how the town operated. You, you you so you get elected in 2022 and yeah. this is this is a big feat for anyone. And I say this with respect because going into an election when there's two incumbents running in your ward and defeating an incumbent is quite a challenge particularly at the municipal level because there's no party politics that's assigned to candidates it's just you're running as yourself mm -hmm. um when the uh, on election night last year and I, I know this is a year ago but i can imagine you still have this that that same feeling that you do today what was that moment like when you saw that little blue check mark beside your name that you said oh no 
Susan is now counselor elect Leahy <laughs> and I am now going to be making the decisions. Take me through that moment for you when you, when that moment came to you or someone call you and say, congratulations, you're the next counselor for ward three. There was great relief. <laughs> <laughs> Love the honest answer, Susan. <laughs> yes. Genuine relief. Uh, I realistically, I look back now and I didn't have a full understanding of what I just got myself into. And maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss in a, in a certain way. Uh, I had I had seen the job uh, from the perspective of a volunteer being on town committees uh, as, a, as a resident, uh, attending events and seeing the mayor or other councillors. I'd even attended uh, council meetings. So I thought I had a, a pretty good idea of what it meant to be a town councillor. But then when you're on the job, on the ground, um, it's it's a whole other experience entirely. And, so what's, uh, but what's, what's so been the biggest learning curve for yourself? Because you, you just mentioned something that I, I ask a lot about, because there's a lot of people right now who are considering putting their name forward for municipal office across Canada. And you are now have been on one side of the table and now on the other side of the table and making these decisions. What advice would you give a prospective candidate who might be putting their name for it for a municipal office across Canada? Be authentic. Be yourself. At the municipal level, we are we we are so fortunate to be knowing to know our neighbors by their names. Uh, we are, you know, I can't, I go to the grocery store. Uh, my neighbors want to talk to me. I walk my dog. My neighbors want to talk to me, but this is what it's all about. There's a very personal aspect to being a municipal politician and the expectations of people uh, because they are your neighbors. And uh, so it's a very, it's a, it's a very hands-on job. You've got to enjoy, genuinely enjoy having conversations with people, spending time with people, um, and I think that it's, if I could give some advice, realistically, it is harder, in my opinion, to run at the municipal level in some ways than it is at the federal or or provincial level, because you do have that party uh, aspect. And sometimes at the federal and political level, uh, which more people are engaged with, uh, they, um, they, they vote according, according to party. But at the municipal level, which is nonpartisan, that they vote for, you know, me as Susan. Do they like Susan? Um, did they meet Susan in a yoga class? Did Su Susan help them out? Uh, you know, when they were, when they have an issue, what, what work did I do on the committee that benefited them in some way? I find municipal politics is really personal. Really it's personal. Certainly, yes. It certainly is. And it's the closest to the people because the decisions yes. you make impact your residents the day after you make them mm -hmm. and i kind of want to ask a very poignant question right now and it's one that i ask all the time on the show so it's no exception to you um you have probably had to make some very tough choices and are going to have to make some tough choices over the next three years in your first term in office and you know and i know that you're not going to please a hundred percent of the people out there and you're going to have people who are not going to be happy with the way that you decide things but you have to live by them because you're making those decisions and you've signed up for the job. How do you do your job when you know that you're going to impact people, but you're hopefully not impacting them in a negative way, but hopefully impacting them in a positive way that's going to help them and your community grow? Mm -hmm. Well, as you mentioned, we just celebrated the first anniversary of the first year of being a town counselor. And I quickly learned that. I quickly learned that I can't satisfy everyone, uh, despite my best intentions, despite <laughs> having the personality where I look at a problem and someone has an issue uh, with, a, with a bylaw or they have concerns about traffic, and I would take those concerns then to staff and, and talk to my fellow counselors about it. And then I, I, was, I was quickly realizing that, you know, I may have good ideas, I may have good suggestions from the community, there are certain goals that are and objectives that need to be met, uh, but it's going to take a lot longer than I than I initially thought in terms of the whole process. But also navigating the the expectations of people. So, but what I have found, my personal experience with neighbors, 
uh, who I want to remain on good terms. You know, I, we want to, we do hope that we can make everyone happy, but it's not realistic. But uh, I have found that when I listen, and I always try to listen to anyone's concerns, whether I agree with their opinions or not, or what their concern is, if I listen respectfully and and I do the work to follow up on answers to their questions, because when I was first starting out, people were asking me all kinds of questions. I don't know about zoning here or zoning there or how this Oak Ridge's Moraine uh, designation affects their personal property. So I had to ask a lot of questions to do my job, but then I would follow up. And so when people felt heard, when people knew I had done the work to ask the questions and follow up with them, even if the answers weren't what they wanted to hear, they uh, their response was, even if it was disappointment that I couldn't fix their problem for them, they were respectful and they were reasonable in their understanding because the most important part of that equation was they knew that I took the time to a, a, address their their concerns and 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 follow through with them, you even if another... the outcomes weren't weren't ideal. Right? They they respected that that I went through that process. Yeah, respect goes a long way in your job as a municipal mm -hmm. councilor. You have to respect people enough to give them your time and effort to listen to them and follow through. But, uh, and I, I say, and I hate painting this broad stroke. I hate doing it, but I think I need to because I think it is a very big issue across Canada. I don't, I, and I say this as my personal opinion, not the counselors who I'm talking to, but my opinion is, I think there's a, a misunderstanding of what the jurisdictional roles that the municipality plays compared to the provincial government and the federal government or even school board, or even uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, East Willenberry is a two tiered uh, community as well. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. the, so then yeah. the, the regional government yeah. as well. Oh Yes. Yeah. So I want to, I want to sort of ask this question in a respectful way as, because you, you talk about respect and I think it is a respectful question. How do you make sure that people feel heard when they don't understand, and maybe you haven't had this experience, where they're coming to you with a health issue or a uh, road issue or a fire issue, which is not the level of government that you represent, but you have to pass them off and say, unfortunately, that's not the role of a town councillor. That's a role for your MPP, your regional councillor, or even your MP. Mm -hmm. That's very true. So an important part of my role is an educational one. It's about raising awareness. And so whatever question people have, and I've been asked to help people find a family doctor, I've been asked to help people find daycare spots, I've been asked all sorts of questions about um, things that I, I can't control. Uh, but it's it, it, the way that you are successful, I believe, is you have good relationships with your MPP with your MP, with the, the regional leaders, and, and, and it's a collaborative effort. So when someone comes to me and says, well, we don't have enough daycare spots in, in East Columbia, I acknowledge that. And then I connect them uh, directly to the person that they will hopefully be able to help them, right? And so um, it's a team effort. And, and part of part of working through challenges, whether it's reducing speed on a regional road, or uh, we can't do it all ourselves, as you, as you indicated, but you have to work collaboratively with regional, provincial and federal governments and have good relationships with all of those uh, team players uh, in order to help satisfy your residents in your community. Yeah. When when you talk about the team effort, it is a big thing that I, I preach on this show because I think team effort comes with one part that we often forget about the residents and the residents mm -hmm. need to engage with their counselors and they can't just hope that the water turns on and the garbage is picked up and that's they're they're OK with what's going on in the municipality. There has to be an engagement. Do you find mm -hmm. that there might be uh, apathy when it comes to municipal government in your year in office? Or are people in your community willing to give their feedback, willing to talk to you about the issues that are going on in your community? There are both uh, individuals, I believe, now. And I thought it was going to be different post-pandemic. I really did. When I was running for uh, for election, 
um, I thought, well, everyone's been at home during the pandemic. And so more people are going to be engaged. More people have spent more time at home. They're going to be more interested in uh, in these specific issues and challenges locally, right? And unfortunately, I found that the opposite was true. And uh, most people um, uh, are very friendly when I'm speaking to them. And But what happens is until they have an issue that directly impacts them personally, I find then that they don't necessarily appreciate the importance of the local grassroots municipal government. How do you and, see your role uh, in changing that though? How do you see your role as a counselor in engaging with people who don't just want to be engaged? Or do you just mm -hmm. hope that people will? That's a major challenge. And I've spoken to my other counselors about that. My my colleagues, uh, I've spoken to the mayor. I speak to counselors in other areas and I find that very helpful. But one, you asked how I felt on the night of the election. I'll go back to that. Well, first was relief that I had won, <laughs> that all of that hard work had paid off. Secondly, I was somewhat disappointed because of the low level of turnout of voters. So it was under 30%. And it was lower than it had ever been, even after the pandemic, which I thought would make a difference in terms of the level of engagement of people. And so that is a tremendous concern to me. Democracy, and we have Remembrance Day coming up. They, we have brave men and women who have sacrificed their lives for our right to vote and for the democracy that we enjoy here in Canada and for the freedom that we enjoy. And so if we don't use it, we are at risk of losing it. And so one of the main things that I, when I'm in conversations with people, I'm passionate about democracy. We need to have a healthy town council in order to be making good decisions for our our communities. And we need to have a strong mandate. And if people are, are choosing not to participate in that, I have grave concerns about the future of our democracy as a whole, as a country. You and, and I both. and so but but how we solve that that challenge, I don't I don't know. I don't know all of the answers. I, I have conversations with um, staff in our in our uh, municipality with the hopes of I believe it comes down to communication and 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 unfortunately I find that at the municipal level we suffer from what is taking place at the federal level or the provincial level so when federal politicians or provincial politicians are letting down people people feel that the there is a, a trust that has been broken that negatively impacts us, at the municipal level. So, you know, there are some residents who feel like, well, why should we bother voting? It doesn't make a difference anyway. You'll hear that kind of a comment, right? Or I'm too focused on, I have to work, I don't have time, uh, you know, to to be engaged in politics because I have to pay my bills. I, I, don't, I don't have time for this, you know, for these conversations. Uh, so we need to work on, and I try and do this one day at a time, just by doing the, my job the best way that I know how is to rebuild that that sense of trust that has been broken. And uh, and so I think at the municipal level, we will see numbers go up when people are more engaged and, and uh, less apathetic at the other levels of government as well. I wish you best of luck on that journey because I can imagine that's a large undertaking for yourself. But I, I'm cautious of time here and I want to turn to sort of a second segment. And uh, this segment is about the town as a whole. And before right. I ask this question, I'm going to preface it as I always do, that this conversation is between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and her opinion alone. I say that because I want to make sure that's on the record. So that way, if people are reading this and say, well, this is what's going on at council. No, it's the councillor's opinion. Mm -hmm. Councillor, in your opinion, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing your community today as of recording this episode? The challenge of housing. The challenge of which is intertwined with 
the challenge of waste management. Uh, we are lacking sewage allocations. So uh, this is, it all comes down to poop. I think, can I say poop on your show? <laughs> you you can say whatever you want on my <laughs> show. A memorable um, clip in the future, that's for sure. There you go. Um, People will be going, did she just say poop? She said yes. poop. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, I want to- It really does come down to that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I want to talk about solutions. Yes. And uh, it's always great to talk about issues, but solutions are more important because uh -huh. you as a municipality, and I say you mm -hmm. as the royal you, as you in council, mm -hmm. have to navigate this ongoing housing crisis that is not just affecting your community, that is affecting all communities across Canada. Right. And I'm not sure, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the Premier, Premier Ford has come out with his housing pledges for municipalities across uh, Ontario. I'm not sure if your community has signed on or if your mayor has signed on to those pledges yet. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong if you have. Um, but in the meantime, every other community is going through this crisis. How do you incentivize developers and builders to come to your community and build housing and do it sustainably enough where you're already at capacity for your waste management system and you're going to have to increase that, which does not come at a price tag of zero. It comes at a hefty price tag. And that means you're going to potentially have to do it on the back of the current residents for future growth. Mm. Well, that's the million dollar question, right? Uh, uh, and and it's and they like I said, they're they're intertwined. They're, you can't have one without the other. We need to invest in the infrastructure so that we can uh, build the houses. But we need to be focusing on building a different type of housing uh, instead of the single detached homes. We need rentals. We need more density. We need townhouses, condos. We need bungalows. Uh, we need lots of, uh, of a mixed variety of housing. But what's happened is the reason we're in the situation we are, and I think it's important to understand the reason in order to find the best solutions, is uh, for decades, again, the all the different levels of government weren't working together thinking long term. It was all just about short term uh, solutions and we weren't working together. So it's going to take a team of us working together to find these answers. So the, this is the issue. This is the challenge, a lack of housing. Uh, and and we are we are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because until we have the sewage allocations, we are in need of a new sewage treatment plant. Uh, we have so many needs, uh, not just housing, but the main challenges are housing and then also transit. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we are a large geographical community uh, in terms of um, our, our how spread out we are. And that if you don't have a car and you live where I live, you're going to have a an, an terribly hard time to get to Newmarket and other places nearby where you need to see a doctor, you need to uh, go to school. Uh, we, so there are many needs on our list. It's uh, we're we're lots of room for improvement, uh, but we but at the same time we're trying to preserve this community where uh, everyone knows each other and uh, and we we maintain that sense of small town while we're the fastest growing community in in municipality in Canada. So it's it's I don't have any easy answers, but we're working as a team on council with the province and with the federal government to, uh, we have lots of developers who want to uh, build in East Wollomberry. So uh, there are other things beyond our control, like uh, labor shortages or building supplies, all of those things where, like you said, we're facing the same challenges as other communities, but we did accept our housing target and we are on our way to uh, doing everything that we can to facilitate the building of houses. That's the best way to put it, right? In an ever-changing landscape, yeah. <laughs> it certainly is. I want to pick up on something that you talked about there, and it's about the short-term visions of a community versus the long-term visions of the community. Now, you kind of threw shade at previous councils and previous governments, provincial, federal, and in the municipality by saying they weren't working collaborative on the long-term goals right. of the community. And I say yeah. shade as in because yeah. it literally was a little dig because truly they weren't and no one mm -hmm. was at that time, hence why mm -hmm. we are in this crisis. Yeah. Now, I'm going to challenge you a little bit here because okay. 
because I like doing that on the show a little bit. <laughs> That's great. You looking towards the long term vision of a community is needed. But you can't forget about the short term vision, the people who are here right now. Mm -hmm. And you have to address those individual issues because you've talked about two very big macro issues, housing mm -hmm. and uh, infrastructure sewage. Right. Now, if I go talk to people in your community, they're going to tell me 100 different things about what their biggest issues are. And they're right. here and now. So how mm -hmm. do you see your role as council and as counselor in balancing the long-term vision of your community with the short-term visions of what people want now so that way they feel like they're being heard and their investments into the community are not being for 20 years from now or 40 years from now when they might not be around? Yes. Well, this is this is the uh, one of the major challenges of being a counselor. You have identified that correctly. You, you, so the way that we do that is, is that uh, we focus on, we break it down into manageable pieces. So for example, the, the month of November, we are now- uh, we're working, Budget season? We're starting, yes, we're starting to work on our budget. <laughs> and so we, we have lists, I have a list of all of the things that the residents have spoken to us about, whether it's resurfacing the local tennis courts, uh, whether it's uh, looking for uh, more better programming in our community centers so that youth have uh, more activities to participate in. And so you do break it down into the daily thing. So uh, fixing the sidewalk in front of certain people's homes. Well, for example, one, so one specific example I'll give is multiple residents have approached me over the past year saying they would like to have the windrows uh, shoveled at the end of their driveways, M mostly seniors or those with some physical challenges who uh, want that service and expect that kind of a service for their taxpayer dollars. So that's what we're going to be talking about. That's one of the items on the agenda for the budget deliberations. How do we set up a program, a pilot program for our senior residents so that we can provide that service? And they, they, um, I believe we do have to uh, provide services like that, ideally, and that we we must find ways uh, to find those, the, the ways to pay for that kind of a service that maintains the quality of life in the, in the community, that uh, that addresses the, the needs, the very practical needs of residents in the community. So that's one example. So it's, it's a, a lot of small uh, victories in terms of uh, programming, services, all of those things. Now, correct me, no, I shouldn't say correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you, East Willenberry is a very large geographic area <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Um, you are there to represent Ward 3 and the issues of Ward 3. But when you get sworn into office, you are sworn in as a town counselor. Yes. Not a Ward 3 counselor, a town right. counselor. Right. And you have to balance the needs of your ward with the individual, uh, with the entire community. And sometimes, I know it's only been a year, but there's going to be some cases where things come pre are presented in front of you that may not affect your residents, but you have to vote on it, or may affect your residents more than it affects other residents, but you have to look at every issue as a town issue. Is mm -hmm. it hard to balance the needs of the people who voted for you against the needs of the community in that sense that you are there to represent the entire community and move the entire community forward, not just the, the people of Ward 3? Well, no. I find that every single decision that I make is about doing what's best for the residents of East Gwilinberry as a whole. So that includes Ward 3. And each of us has an equal vote on council. But again, going back to residents' understanding of the situation, um, they don't necessarily understand that uh, that I represent all of East Gwilinberry, not just the, the the voters specifically in my ward who voted for me. But uh, the 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 important thing is to be an advocate and a champion locally for what's best for for Ward 3 residents. But I have found that that is almost always what's best for EG as a whole. And uh, and so uh, we, and, and uh, with my fellow counselors, uh, we 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 help each other out with with issues in their uh, in their wards as well. 
And uh, and so, but I'm I'm very happy to be a, a a champion and voice for the residents of Ward Three. So they know that I am looking out for their best interests. So yeah. now I've been, I've been accused on this show of talking only about the negative things about a community when we talk about the community as a whole. So I like to flip the switch a little bit here, and I say. What's East Willenberry getting right? What do you boast about when it comes to your community? And you say, you know what? Your communities might be doing it great. We're doing it better. What are the issues and what are the priorities that you say that your community and you as a counselor and council are doing right to make sure that you are set up for the future and that growth that you're hoping to come by? We're being fiscally responsible. We are, we have no debt. And so <laughs> I don't I, I don't know of any other there may be there may be one out there maybe Chris you can you can research and tell me but I believe we are one of the few in Ontario if not maybe the only one that has no debt we have zero debt and we have the lowest uh, relative taxes in relation to the other municipalities in York region in the N6 and so that has come from uh, my predecessors as well doing a good job about being fiscally responsible. So uh, we have lots of needs and lots of wants, but we we have to say no. We have to say no. You know, it's like being a parent. It's easy to say yes when you have teenagers and they're asking you for something and 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 you know, you want to give in and you you want to you want to satisfy everybody, but uh it's harder to say no, but you have to say no in in order to uh be, you know, fiscally responsible long term. Is it hard to say no as a politician? <laughs> because usually whenever I hear someone say, oh, the worst thing that you can say in politics is no, because you know you're going to have to be reelected in two, three, four or five years from now. But for yeah. you, it seems you, you just have to say no in a grounded way, but in a respectful way, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I in some ways, I don't call myself a politician. Maybe I'm still new at it in the sense that uh, people, other people have said, well, now that you're elected, Susan, no, you're a politician. My mindset isn't thinking like maybe the traditional politician. I, I just make every decision on a, on a case by case basis. And I believe that, and I hope that, uh, people see that and that they know when they come to me for a decision that I will be making decisions in what's the best interest for the people. And in terms of political ambitions, that doesn't come into, I'm happy being a town councillor. I'm focused on being a town councillor, doing the best job that I can as a town councillor. And we'll we'll see where, where life goes because in politics, things change on a daily basis. So I, I, I feel like you can't be just, you know, blowing with the wind and, and making a decision here and there and everywhere. I feel that if my compass is what's best for the residents, it can't lead me wrong. I appreciate that. Yeah. I want to turn to my last segment here, and it's my favorite segment that I like to talk about, because I think as Canadians, we should be visiting our great communities within Canada. Don't get me wrong, going south to Cancun or Puerto Vallarta or Mexico or even the States is great, but spending our economic dollars here in Canada, supporting our tourism industry here in Canada is very much a priority for me. And as someone who has promised that if you come on my show, I will visit your community. So I will what? be in East Wilmbury next year sometime, hopefully. Um, what, sh what are the tourist destinations? What are the hot spots, the hidden treasures that you want to boast about on this show right now as we have listeners from across Canada and around the world? Well, Chris, I will. I know immediately where I will take you. We have a very special place in Sharon, right beside our civic center where we have our council meetings. And it's called the Sharon Temple. Originally, Sharon was called Hope. And it was settled by a group, uh, the Children of Peace, which is a Quaker sect. And uh, they built this Sharon Temple, which is a national historic site, which very few people have heard of. But it's a national historic site. It was built in 1825. And, uh, and the Children of Peace uh, were very much, uh, their values were focused on peace and equality and political justice. And the, this historic site played a key role in the development of Canadian democracy because uh, there was uh, the Children of Peace were supporters of 
William Lyon Mackenzie and the rebellion in 1837. And so after that, they campaigned for Robert Baldwin and Louis Hippolyte Fontaine, La Fontaine, who were known later as the fathers of responsible government. And this is a beautiful building visually. Uh, it is a, uh, it has no electricity. It's just as it originally is. And there are original buildings on this property. Uh, we just unveiled uh, back in September, the Hope and Truth sculpture uh, of, that was created from a 200 year old sugar maple tree that fell during a storm. And, uh, and the indigenous community came together and they created a sculpture out of the tree trunk that was remaining. And, uh, and we have a close connection with the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation. And so I would take you to the Sharon Temple and talk to you about the role that it played in democracy, not only of our community, but our country. And then I would take you on a tour of the farms that we are fortunate to have in our, in our region. And my favorite festival during the year, it happens a week before uh, Thanksgiving and it's called the Farm to Fork Tour. And so you go on a tour of all the different farms. We have mushroom farms, we have potato farms, we have farms that sell pies and baked goods, and we have uh, uh, places that raise uh, animals in, in, a, in a healthy way, so uh, natural meats. We have a trout farm, we do the lavender farm, uh, we have honey, we have, we have everything that you could imagine. And it is absolutely my favorite day of visiting all of the farms and getting all of the ingredients that we then use for our Thanksgiving meal uh, the following week. Apple cider, we have an <laughs> apple orchard. So, and this is all right on the, the cusp of um, the, the border with a new market, you know? So we're north of the city of Toronto and on a good day, it's about 50 minutes on a really bad traffic day. It might be an hour and a half, but, uh, but we have lots of... Um, of residents from Toronto who come up on a beautiful weekend and they drive up to East Bloomberry and they'll visit the farms and then there are activities like coming up like there are Halloween activities but also there's a Christmas act so another favorite event of mine is run by uh, Marjo Niemi she is a baker and farmer and she and her family she has 10 children they all help out on the farm and they have a wonderful uh, Christmas market. And so we have Christmas market there where you can go and visit Santa and go on the Polar Express. And then there are all kinds, it's kind of like a traditional European style uh, Christmas market where there are all little wood huts set up and there's bonfires and marshmallows. And, and so it's that, it's that quality of life that you feel when you have that small town atmosphere, despite the fact that we are, we are, growing at a, at a rapid pace so yeah so I would take you on a on a farm to fork tour and uh and then educate you about the history of democracy in East Willenberry at the Sharon Temple I have uh taken four years of university history I have done four years of uh, high school history and I've never heard of Sharon Temple in my life and I went to Queens and I went to a community like literally right around the corner from East Gwillenberry. So mm -hmm. I feel like I've been failed as a, <laughs> as a historian. Um, I want to sort of ask a, a million dollar question. I know you said we already had the million dollar question, but I think mm -hmm. this is the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. And I think every municipal politician, even though you don't call yourself a municipal politician, uh, should be able to answer this. And probably does know how to answer this. And it is, in your opinion, what makes your community such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? It's absolutely the people. The people who live here. The people are incredible. Um. Very simple. <laughs> it certainly is. I, I appreciate that. Simple, but honest. I love it. Um, Susan, I want to take a moment and say thank you. This has been a wonderful 45 minutes of uh, my time. A uh, great way to sort of, we're recording this on a Friday. So those who are about to go, well, this is airing on a Monday. Well, we're recording this on a Friday. This is the best way to end a week of interviews with a 
very engaged, very informative, very passionate municipal politician, municipal councillor, a local elected leader from your uh, from Ontario. So thank you so much for doing this. And thank you so much for serving your community. I don't think municipal politicians hear that enough, and I'm trying to change that. So thank you for serving. I appreciate that. And it gives me great pleasure. It's all about making a difference. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape communities from across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our show. As we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. If you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. We couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can continue to deliver the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.